Welcome to English Easy Story. Why do I need to read in English? My students often ask me. They think I go to classes. I do my homework. I watch films in English. Why should I read books? Actually, reading is the best way to improve your English. I will tell you why. First, reading is very important. Not only did one in four people go to university in the past, but now more people go to university. All jobs require more reading and writing than years ago. This is true for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're an office worker or a mechanic. Second, reading will improve your speaking, writing, vocabulary. And grammar better than any other way. It won't improve your listening directly, but it will improve your vocabulary. When you have a better English vocabulary, you can listen more easily and improve your listening. That way, in school, you probably read a lot of English boring textbooks and stories with exercises at the end. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading for pleasure. That means reading a book you enjoy because you enjoy it. You are not reading because your teacher said read this book. You are not reading because you think I should read this book. You are reading because you want to. In an experiment in schools in America, they gave some boys free books. They were fun books like James Bond. They said you can do what you want. You don't have to read the books. But the boys did read the books. They read a lot of books. Some boys read a book every two days. After years, they gave the students a test. The students who got the books got better at reading and writing, and they liked school more. The students who did not get the books did not get better at reading and writing. In fact, some of them got worse. This isn't just true for native speakers. They also did an experiment on students learning English in the Fiji Islands. They tested three ways to teach. The first way was normal English teaching with grammar classes, exercises, and so on. The second way was reading in silence. The students read books in class. The third way was reading together. The teacher read books to the students. After one year. The two ways with reading were the best. They were much better than the students who did normal English classes. They did the experiment again. This time in Singapore. They're the students who read in style and did very well. They did the best in grammar tests. Other students did grammar classes but performed worse in grammar tests. In normal classes, we try to remember grammar and vocabulary. When we read, we learn them naturally. Maybe you're thinking, when I read in English, it's too hard. I have to use the dictionary all the time. It's boring. I can't do it. I understand. So I wrote this book. I think this book will make you like reading because the stories are easy and fun. The early stories are short and easy, and the later stories are longer and harder. When you finish the book, you will think, "Wow, I did it!" I make a podcast called English Listening Practice. Nine of the stories in this book I wrote for English Listening Practice. One of the stories I wrote for this book, but when I made this book, I made the stories better. 
Now you can read the stories at beginner, intermediate, intermediate, or advanced levels. The stories are all fairy tales. Some are very popular fairy tales, but some are not so popular. One of them I wrote myself. Maybe you're thinking fairy tales are for children. I need useful vocabulary. I need to learn about business and science. That can't be fun. Actually, the vocabulary in these stories will be useful. McQuillan did an experiment where he looked at vocabulary and novels, and 8% of the words were on academic word lists. These are lists of words that you need to know to study at university. Rolls and Rogers also did an experiment. They asked if students read a million words of science fiction. Will they learn important science words for studying at university? The answer was yes. So yes, fairy tales are useful for you too, but I understand if you still don't believe me. When I learned about all this, I found it hard to believe too. But I like to try new things. And I love learning languages. So in 2017, I decided to do an experiment. I had wanted to learn Spanish for a long time, but I didn't learn much in normal classes. I said I will read a million words in Spanish. Afterward, I will see what my level is. A million words is about 40 novels, so it was a lot of work. I started with very easy reading, like this book. Then I started reading translations of books that I knew in English. For example, I had read Harry Potter and Game of Thrones in English, so I read them in Spanish. 2. Finally, I read new books in Spanish. I read Latin American authors such as Isabel Allende, Jorge Luis Borges, and Manuel Puig. I loved them. I also listened to podcasts, but I always read the transcripts and added the words to my goal. After I finished reading a million words, I wrote and talked to native speakers. I was at an intermediate level. I could understand almost everything I read. I could understand people when they spoke clearly, and I could have conversations. I had spent most of my time reading, not speaking. In one year, I learned more than most students learn. In two years, I didn't try to remember grammar and vocabulary. I learned them naturally. Maybe you're thinking, I don't believe this. Or maybe you're thinking, wow. I'm going to read for hours every day. But I have to say something very important. You must read books that are easy and fun. If a book is too difficult or too boring, put it down and find another one. Stephen Krashen, an expert in language teaching, says only read things in English that are fun and interesting. Read things that are really easy that you wouldn't read in your native language because they are too easy. So you can read comics, magazines, detective stories, romance stories, and so on. Don't feel bad about reading. Translate actions. If you read very easy books, when you see a word you don't know, you will understand the meaning easily. You won't have to use a dictionary. So what is easy? Experiments show that you should understand at least 98% of the words in the text. 98%. That's so high, I know. But let me show you an example. Here's a text where 50% of the words are not real words. 
so you should understand 50% of the words. Jerry fled out of bed and opened the curtains. He blamed to himself as he made breakfast. He made coffee and put butter on his puffer. Someone called his phone and he picked it up. He was very surprised by who was tingling, so his ink fell on the floor. Is that easy to understand? Could you read? Why do I need to read in English? My students often ask me. They think I go to classes. I do my homework. I watch films in English. Why should I read books? Actually, reading is the best way to improve your English. I will tell you why. First, reading is very important. Not only did one in four people go to university in the past, but now more people go to university. All job require more reading and writing than years ago. This is true for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're an office worker or a mechanic. Second reading will improve your speaking, writing, vocabulary, and grammar better than any other way. It won't improve your listening directly, but it will improve your vocabulary. When you have a better English vocabulary, you can listen more easily and improve your listening. That way. In school, you probably read a lot of English boring textbooks and stories with exercises at the end. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading for pleasure. That means reading a book you enjoy because you enjoy it. You are not reading because your teacher said, read this book. You are not reading because you think I should read this book. You are reading because you want to. In an experiment in schools in America, they gave some boys free books. They were fun books like James Bond. They said, you can do what you want. You don't have to read the books. But the boys did read the books. They read a lot of books. Some boys read a book every two days. After years, they gave the students a test. The students who got the books got better at reading and writing. And they liked school more. The students who did not get the books did not get better at reading and writing. In fact, some of them got worse. This isn't just true for native speakers. They also did an experiment on students learning English in the Fiji Islands. They tested three ways to teach. The first way was normal English teaching with grammar classes, exercises, and so on. The second way was reading in silence. The students read books in class. The third way was reading together. The teacher read books to the students. After one year, the two ways with reading were the best. They were much better than the students who did normal English classes. They did the experiment again. This time in Singapore. They're the students who read in style and did very well. They did the best in grammar tests. Other students did grammar classes, but performed worse in grammar tests. In normal classes, we try to remember grammar and vocabulary. When we read, we learn them naturally. Maybe you're thinking, when I read in English, it's too hard. I have to use the dictionary all the time. It's boring. I can't do it. I understand. So I wrote this book. I think this book will make you like reading because the stories are easy and fun. 
The early stories are short and easy, and the later stories are longer and harder. When you finish the book, you will think, wow, I did it. I make a podcast called English Listening Practice. Nine of the stories in this book I wrote for English listening practice. One of the stories I wrote for this book. But when I made this book, I made the stories better. Now you can read the stories at beginner, intermediate, intermediate, or advanced levels. The stories are all fairy tales. Some are very popular fairy tales. But some are not so popular. One of them I wrote myself. Maybe you're thinking fairy tales are for children. I need useful vocabulary. I need to learn about business and science. That can't be fun. Actually, the vocabulary in these stories will be useful. McQuillan did an experiment where he looked at vocabulary and novels, and 8% of the words were on academic word lists. These are lists of words that you need to know to study at university. It was very, very difficult. I was listening to rap music, which was way too difficult. I gave that up. But I was watching English movies without subtitles and I would listen. At first, I wouldn't understand. I would understand maybe 5% of it. Right? And then I would understand, I think, oh, that's what she means. And 10%, 20%. As my English improved, I noticed I would understand the movie more and more. So, you have to immerse yourself talking English, listen to English music, watch English movies, do as much of that as you can. Naturally, you'll pick up the slang. You'll pick up certain stories or phrases. That's how you learn the English language. Then you make it fun. It doesn't have to be, oh, I have to sit down and study. No. Make it fun. Talk to people who speak English. Interact. Connect. Read. Watch. Listen. That's how you get good. That's how I got good. Step number five to improve your English fluency is to hang out with people who speak English. I know it sounds so obvious, but that's how you do it. I remember in college I would see groups of people where Chinese students only hung out with Chinese students. Korean students hung out with Korean students, and Japanese students hung out with Japanese students. I did the opposite. I would go and hang out with people who spoke English. I would hang out with Caucasians. I would hang out with people who grew up locally and spoke perfect English. I would just talk and hang out. We would go to the library and I would try to talk as much as possible. Listen, ask questions to get comfortable. Another thing I did was actually get a Korean girlfriend who spoke English, so that's another way to do it. I'm not saying that's the only way to learn, but if you want to learn a new language, talk with people who speak the language. You'll be shocked at how quickly you pick that up, how quickly you can pick up the language. Let me give you a bonus tip. A bonus step if you want it. Step number six is going into a state of overlearning. Let me explain. If you are thinking about, let's say, learning a language, let's say you're here and you want to get to this level. The fastest way to get to this level is to actually go into a state of overlearning. Let's take an exercise example. If you want to have a stronger bicep, 
Let's say you're only doing your curls with a hypothetical weight of 20 labels. That's the amount of strength you have. If you want to make that 20 labels easier to lift, guess what? Train with 25 labels or 30 labels. That's over preparation. Over learning. That's what I mean. You want to stay in over learning. So what I did, because I'm in business, not only learning the English language, but also learning how to sell, how to close deals, how to do marketing was not only for day-to-day -day communication, but also for something with higher stakes where there was money involved. That's how I became a fluent English speaker. Now, I'm sure that you have had moments in your learning where you have felt like you progressed very quickly. It comes easily. You're motivated. It's fun, but at some point you hit a wall and you feel like you'll never speak fluently, confidently, and naturally. You are not alone. This feeling of being stuck is often called the intermediate plateau, and I've been there. It can be a comfortable place. You can speak and understand in many situations. But for most of us, it's not enough. We want to enjoy the language as freely as we do. Our mother tongue. As a native, I've never had the experience of learning English as a second language. So I want to bring you an expert who has success. Fully done it here at Real Life English. If you listen to our podcast, chances are you have already heard me on there. But today I'm here to tell a little bit of my story and how I went from speaking zero English to the level of English I have today. I'm just like you. I'm an English learner myself, and I had to learn English from scratch in my country. Here in Brazil. I've never been abroad, so I'm going to tell you how I did it, and hopefully that's going to give you some ideas and inspiration for your English journey. But before we get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the bell down below, because every week we put out videos to help you speak English with confidence and naturally. So now let's get started. My story with English began when I was 15 years old. As I told you, I come from Brazil and at that time I knew zero English. I couldn't speak anything, I couldn't read. I couldn't write. But at 15, something magical kind of happened because I started to have this desire to become bilingual. I don't know exactly why that was, but the idea of using two languages to communicate and express myself was very attractive to me. I remember also that I looked around me. I saw my family, my friends, my social circle, and I realized that no one knew English. So I started to associate the idea of knowing English with having a better life or having more opportunities. I took an English course and it was really helpful because I talked to him and he was kind enough to lend me his old course books. Every semester his school would change the books. So the books that he wouldn't use anymore, he would lend them to me. That's how I started. I began by studying with old course books from my friend and a grammar book that he had lent me. I was studying by myself with those old books, and I remember that I was really fascinated. English was always interesting to me. I always loved the language, but I was then actively studying it. I was reading stuff in English, copying stuff from the book that I saw, and I was already very excited because I was using another language to write, communicate, or express myself. My speaking was really, really bad at that time. I couldn't speak yet, 
even though I grew up kind of watching movies with my parents in English and listening to music in English as well. I didn't have my speaking skills developed yet. I remember that I would try to read stuff out loud from the books I was studying with, and it was a disaster. The words wouldn't flow. I had no idea how to pronounce certain words. For example, loud was really bad and frustrating, but I kept going because at the end of the day, that was all I did for pretty much three years, from 15 to 18. Most of the time I would study with books, and that was the first step mistake I made. And I'm here to tell you this because I took way too much time, too long to start speaking. You don't want to do that. At that time, 20 years ago, it was much more difficult to find people to practice speaking with. So I just studied with books. But nowadays we have so many more cool resources like apps. Speaking of apps, I can tell you about the Real Life English app. As you probably know, with the app you can have conversations with people from all around the world at the touch of a button. Plus, you can listen to our podcast there and access the transcripts. It's just amazing. So if you haven't downloaded the app yet, make sure you do that because it is one of the resources that, for example, I wish I had when I was learning English and trying to improve my speaking 20 years ago. But then something magical happened in my life when I turned 18. I started working, and I have to say that my work experience, the jobs I've had in my life was crucial in my English development, especially the speaking and listening skills. Let me explain. My first job was at a drugstore where I worked as a cashier, but there was something interesting about that drugstore. The peers would see me at lunchtime, kind of eating and studying at the same time. So pretty quickly, I became the English guy at the drugstore. Every time a foreign customer came in, I was the one to be called, Hey, Chicago, there's a foreign person here. Go help that person. Then I would go there and speak in English with those people and try to help them out. I remember one time it was kind of funny. I was at the cash register talking to an American customer, a lady. I was trying to talk to her in English and explain that I had never been abroad and everything, but I was still learning the language. I said, oh, yeah, I've never been abroad. And she kind of stopped me and said, oh, I think you mean abroad. I was like, oh, abroad. Oh, thank you very much for the correction. I appreciate that. So that was one example of how having these little interactions with customers helped me. Sometimes I would say something wrong, like abroad, and then the person would help me by correcting me. I had many of these small interactions that were really useful. This is another tip that I can give you. Be open to correction. If somebody corrects your English, your pronunciation, or the way you use a word, this is actually great. I was speaking to Americans on the phone six hours a day, six days a week for a year. So in a way, it was my version of living abroad. It was my version of having an exchange program because I was really speaking to natives for a year. That really helped me with my speaking skills and my listening skills. But it's important to mention that I only got that job because I already knew enough English to get it. All those years that I spent working and studying paid off because those years allowed me to get this job. And then I improved even more. So here's what I have to say to you. Keep learning, 
keep developing yourself, and start looking for a job. Opportunities that allow you to use your English on a daily basis. You're going to improve even more between those jobs. That was actually the moment when I really started to create my own immersion in English. Now, because I was already using English in my daily routine at work, I was really serious about it. Everything I did was in English. Watching movies in English series, listening to music. I love rock and roll. For example, so I always listen to my favorite bands in English with my very first paychecks. That's what I did. We didn't have Netflix or streaming services at that time, so I actually would go to media stores to buy DVDs and CDs. By the way, if you want to know my exact step by step process that I use to improve my English with movies and TV series, let us know in the comments. Maybe I can make another video in the future explaining how I did it. Finally, there is one weird thing that happened in my life that really helped me take my English to the next level, and that was becoming an English teacher. I started teaching English at 21 years old, so it's been 14 or 15 years now. I have to say that teaching English and helping people with their English was actually an experience that really helped me master the English language to a whole new level. When you teach, it's like you are learning again. When I have to teach a class or help someone, I have to prepare. I have to study the topic myself. Be familiar with it. Think of different ways to explain things and give examples. That mental process really helps me better understand the topic so I can explain it to my students. It's a win-win. If you teach somebody, you win because you are kind of revising information and studying it again, and the other person benefits because they are learning new stuff with you.